This clip is about inverse function functions. A function f defined on the set A. So suppose I take a function f A to B. Then this function is called invertible if for each yeah, it's called invertible if for each small b in the range. So I take something that is created by f. So I take something in the range of f. And I call such f invertible if for each b in the range of f there's a unique a in capital A that is mapped onto B. So each B in the range of F has a unique original. So basically, if I pick something in the image, then there's a unique A that can be associated with this B. In that case, I can define the inverse function of F, the inverse of F. So if I can associate to each B belonging to the image of F or the range of F, I have a unique value A, such as F A equals B, then the inverse of F is the function, which is denoted F minus 1, is defined on the range of F, and it maps the range of F back to A, in the sense that When f a equals b, then f minus 1 b, the inverse of b, the inverse value of b, is defined as a. So actually, b and a belong together. b is mapped onto a if and only if the function value of a equals b. Well, for example, what kind of functions are invertible? Well, the injective functions are invertible. Why is that? Well, per thing in the image or the range of a function, there's a unique original. Yeah, the horizontal line test will cross the graph of a function only once. Now, for instance, this is the case for the function f from r plus to r plus such that f of x equals the square root of x. This function is injective and therefore invertible. Well, we have the following properties. For all a in, in capital A, we have that the image under f inverse of f a well, f a belongs to b, f a equals b, so I have the f inverse equals b. And the f inverse of b is again mapped onto a. So actually, once I pick f to create something else out of a, b, then f inverse maps actually a back to a. So actually... And also, the sim something similar holds for all B and capital B. So F inverse of B equals A. So I get the F of A, but the F of A equals B. Yeah, so actually, if I pick up B and apply F minus 1 and then F, then nothing changes. And the same holds here for the composition of F together with F inverse. So whether I compose f inverse with f or f with f inverse, two times I get the identity. Something that I throw in those functions comes out unchanged. So that is the identity. Something else holds as well. So the range of f equals the domain of f inverse. Yeah, by definition. On the other hand, if I look at the domain of f, and the domain of f equals the range of f inverse. So 
I see that for invertible functions, there's a 1-1 one -one correspondence between the domain and range. If I pick something in the range, then I can find its original in the domain. And if I pick something in the domain, then of course I have one element in its range. Well, how to de determine the inverse of a function in general? How to find a formula? Well, there's no general recipe, but sometimes we're lucky and capable of um, using the formula of f to find its inverse. Yeah, for instance, here we have the function fx equals the square root of x defined on r plus on, on the set of all non-negative numbers. Then f of x equals y is equivalent with the statement that the square root of x equals y. So I know that by squaring left and right that I can find the original of y under f which equals x equal y squared. So, since I know that fx equals y, yeah, so we know that fx equals y, if and only if the f inverse of y equals x, yeah, we must have that actually we have x equals y squared. So I know that f inverse y equals y squared. So this is the formula for the f inverse, for the inverse function f inverse. Okay, there's also another way to derive the inverse, at least the graph of the inverse function. Well, recall that the graph of a function f is actually a subset in R2. So in the Euclidean plane with y and x-axis. So it's a subset, yeah, so the graph of a function is actually a set, g of f in R2, where these are pairs of numbers, is a set of pairs of numbers, yeah, g of f is the set of all pairs of numbers where x is something in the domain of a function f and I just pair it with its image. Yeah, so I have x in the domain of f and I look at all those pairs which forms the graph of the function f. Well, I have the following uh, uh, property of the graph of inverse functions. There's a very nice relationship between a point on the graph of f and the, a point on the graph of its inverse. So suppose f has an inverse, then and suppose that x, y is on the graph of the function f. Then I know that this y here should be the image of x. So I know that the f of x equals y, in which case f minus 1 y, the inverse of y equals y, and this can be read as, well, then the pair y x should be on the graph of the function f inverse. So actually when I take pick a point x y on the graph of f, then I know that by just switching those numbers, y and y comma x, that must be on the graph of f inverse. So actually I get the inverse of the graph of the, 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 uh, the graph of the inverse function is no more than a reflection of g of f, the graph of the function in the line x is equals y. So, for example, look at the function we've been discussing before, fx equals the square root of x on r plus, with inverse f inverse equals uh, y equals y squared. Then I see that the white line over here gives me the graph of f, 
and by just reflecting in it in the line x equals y, I get the parabola y squared, which gives me the graph of the function f inverse. So now we determine a formula for the inverse. The f inverse of f of f, where f is defined by the formula fx equals, yeah, it's a rational function, by fx equals 1 plus x divided by 3 plus x. And I'm going to study for this function on, on the domain minus 3 infinity. Yeah, so actually this is a, the set a, and f is defined on the set A. So, basically, I try to find a formula for the inverse. I try, well, here is my x, something from the domain, and here's something that comes out according to this formula. Then actually, given y, I want to calculate x. Yeah, so how can this be done? Well, if I know that x belongs to minus 3 infinity, then I know that 3 plus x multiplic uh, multiplicating by 3 plus x on the left and the right hand side gives me 3 plus x times y equals 1 plus x. Just working out this term, I get 3 times y plus xy equals 1 plus x. Yeah, so now I want to solve for x, so anything that corresponds to x is moved to the left hand side so I get 3 times y uh, uh, x times y which is over here minus x which moves on the, on the left hand side equals 1 minus 3y so then I find x equals 1 minus 3y divided by y minus 1 so as a formula for the inverse function, I calculate basically if I have an, a number in the domain of f inverse, then this is the formula 1 minus 3x divided by x minus 1 that gives me the function value of the inverse. So look at a graph of f. Yeah, so here is the graph of f. If x is arbitrarily large, then I see, well, the property of rational functions. I get a horizontal asymptote at 1. Yeah. So now I'm going to depict in the same picture, I'm going to depict f inverse. Well, I know that f inverse, the graph of f inverse, is basically the the reflection of the graph of f in the line x equals y, right? So here is the line in blue, x equals y, and, uh, and now I'm going to reflect the white line over here in the blue line. And actually what I get here is that a vertical asymptote at minus 3 moves into a horizontal asymptote over here, minus 3. And I see here that the vertical asymptote in 1 of f inverse goes to the horizontal asymptote of f. Yeah. So this is the picture. And I, from, from this I can also see that actually the domain of the function f inverse is exactly minus infinity to 1, where 1 is excluded as a value because it's asymptote.